Welcome to Complexity Made Simple. My name is Paul Allen and before we get into today's video well I'm just going to remind you the three books that are on sale drink tea and read the paper if you're a green belt and a black belt and you want simple instruction on how to apply your skill design of experiments for 21st century engineers and finally a statistical process control for small batch production. They are all available from lulu.com and the links are in the video below. Welcome to the latest video. Today's video newsletter, well, this is answering a problem that um, someone who watched a, a YouTube video has passed to me. They wanted me to discuss power and sample size so when you're doing a scientific test and you have to decide on a sample size the sample size has power and sometimes that's part of the calculation in deciding what the sample size should be so here's the subject we're going to go sample size Now I've got to be honest, power is not something that I normally concern myself with when I'm deciding on a sample size. So I'm going to explain what these uh, two phrases mean first of all, and then we'll discuss practical ways of dealing with uh, power. Okay, so when you do a scientific test, when you do an engineering test, what you're trying to do of course is, is move the results. You're trying to move the process. So you're trying to say, well, I put in some setting or I used a certain amount of material. I got result A. What I'm now going to do is I'm going to adjust the process and I want to observe a different result. I want to see if the result shifts. And I get result B. Now in order to do that, you are going to need to select a sample size. So normally the advice that I give to my clients is very straightforward. I just say 30 to 50, as long as you're somewhere in that guideline, we're probably good to go. And I rarely use any kind of fancy calculation. Just occasionally, if I think something's important, and I think the sample size might be different to this, I might encourage uh, I might encourage a sample size calculation, but usually I simply just use that guideline, and the guideline works really well. Now then, the, the sample size you choose will have a power. Now what does power mean? Well, what it means is this. It's the ability to see the shift. In this case, look, A and B, the center, the average, the mean of the results was shifted. And depending on how big the shift is and how powerful the sample size is, that's going to tell you whether your sample size is capable of seeing the movement that you're about to create. Now let me give you a, a, a really wild example of how a small sample size can see very big movements, but a small sample size clearly has no power. So if you take a look at these two data sets here, what I've basically suggested, look, is that we have uh, test, uh, test A, test A is landing at around about I think it's about 13.3 millimeters. We've made some adjustment to the process. Let's say we've adjusted the temperature and we've made the result move all the way over here to approximately 15.3 millimeters. Yeah, so, so it's a nice big shift 
in the result. Now you can see, look, there are only, the sample size is four. There's only a sample size of four. So if you look up here at my guideline, you'd go, oh, you're violating your guideline. Why? You've only got a sample size of four. Is that going to work? Well, look how far the process got shifted. The process has got completely moved. Unlike this here, look, where there's an overlap. There is no overlap. There's no confusion here. The result is two millimeters apart. So if I do a hypothesis test, and, I, and I've done one here, look, I've done a t-test. When I ran the t-test, what did the p-value say? Well, look, the p-value is actually very low. I mean, it's set on naught uh, here, look, in the cell. If I click on the cell, I can read the number at the top. It's not zero. It's just a very small, very small number. But as far as we're concerned, the p-value is pretty much zero. This hypothesis test has the power to see that shift. It has the power to see that shift, but that's because it's a very big shift. Now look, if I maintain the sample size of four, and I basically maintain these numbers, so all I'm gonna do is make the numbers come closer and closer together. I won't alter the spread of them, I will just alter the fact that there's four numbers telling me a new average. If I make that new average get closer and closer together, you can see that the p-value will start to deteriorate. Yeah, to the point where, when I get to this point, look, when I'm comparing two data sets, effectively now look what am I doing. I've got two data sets with a sample size of four that are very, very close to one another. There is a large opportunity for lots of confusion in the overlap zone. And now you can see, can the t-test see that shift? And the answer is no. Suddenly the p-value look is no longer red. It's telling me that it cannot see a significant change in the result. But if I maintain the same average, so you can see the two averages on that uh, Excel spreadsheet. If I maintain the same averages and I compare, um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna use the same average and the same standard deviation. So I'm just gonna take though 100 numbers. I'm gonna take a sample size of 100 and I'm going to compare them with the t-test. You see how the p-value starts to change? The p-value is starting to get lower. And if I make the sample size large enough, so if I take a large enough sample here, and a large enough sample here, eventually the p-value will say it can tell that there is a significant shift in these two process results. And that's the power. As the sample size gets bigger, the sample size has the power to see smaller shifts. That's power. So one of the things that you will often do before you start when you're doing a test is to say, how small a shift would be significant to me. So if you decide that the shift here of just 0.1 of a millimeter would be significant, and you think your test is only likely to move by 0.1 of a millimeter, you would want a sample size that can see that shift because there's gonna be lots of overlap here. There's gonna be lots of confusion. You want a more powerful sample size, okay? Now then, why don't I tend to worry about power? One of the reasons I don't tend to worry about power is because I'm doing these tests in a DOE. And the advice that I give to my clients is that you make the high and the low setting. So let's say you change the temperature here to get this shift. You make those changes in temperature 
as wide as you can reasonably go. In other words, you put a massive signal in the DOE test results. You put a massive signal through the results. Now when you put a massive signal through the results, do I need to worry about the power of the test? No. So let me just show you what I mean by that, just in a little example. Just imagine that we are firing a catapult and that we want to see the effect of pulling the angle back, stretching the elastic slightly more. So we pull the angle back and we want to measure where the ball lands. Now if I get the, the, the test nice and wide, 160 degrees compared to 180 degrees, when I get my four samples, four samples here, a little bit of noise of course, and I get my four samples here with a little bit of noise. But you can see, look, we've got a very big shift, very little noise and a very big shift. We've got this situation. Now why have I got that situation? Because I chose 160 and 180. I'm in control of the signal. I can make the signal nice and big if I want to. Therefore, I don't need a powerful sample size because the signal is massive and small sample sizes can see big signals. But of course, I could have chose a much more conservative set of tests. I could have tested 172 degrees compared to 170 degrees. And now, when we get that little bit of noise, now I can hardly see this shift. Well, that, the reason why I can hardly see this is because of course, the, the, the distance that's been affected has hardly been moved. So in order to see that shift, maybe I've only moved the results by five centimeters. Well, in order to see that result, I'm gonna need a bigger sample size, a more powerful sample size. So the bigger the sample size, the more powerful it is, the smaller shift that it can actually detect. Now, one last word of warning about the power of the test. This is especially true when you have lots of data. So if you have, um, you know, if, if the data is related to the population of a country, for example, um, and you wanted to say, well, let's say we've got everybody's weight in the country, you would literally have 60 million data points if you've got 60 million data points and you wanted to say, do the people in Scotland weigh more than the people in England? Because you've got 5 million data points in Scotland and 55 million data points in England, the answer is always going to be yes, because that sample size is so powerful, it thinks everything is a signal. So you have to balance. This is important. You have to balance the sample size, its power, and the signal that you're creating. That's how you have to do it. Now, now my personal way of doing this is to make a big signal use a guideline for the sample size I don't need to worry about the power so I'll keep the whole thing super simple that's that's power and sample size the power of a sample size is the ability for it to see a particular size of shift if it's a big shift it doesn't need to be a powerful sample size if it's a small shift it needs to be a very big sample size to be able to see what's happening and that's the power of the sample size, but this is how I use it. I don't overcomplicate it. I make big signals in my data sets, and if I get big signals in my data sets, my sample size can see what's going on, and I don't have to worry about it. So power and sample size, it's a statistical technique, but once you get practical and you know how to use it, you don't have to waste time doing overly statistical things. The power and the sample size, 
There's your answer.